right. Hello, hello. It kicked off my Bluetooth. Give me one second, y'all. Okay, I think I'm good. Happy hump day. Hey. Okay. Happy hump day. Happy hump day. That's what I'm talking about. Awesome, awesome. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in. This is my second week. I'm excited to be here with you. I'm going to put my phone on silent because it's been blowing up today. And um, we're going to get right started because what we're going to learn is not to be on CPT. So welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome to High Performance at High Noon. This is your midweek lunchtime call for high performing entrepreneurs and professionals such as yourself. And of course, I am your girl, Jai Johnson, your work-life integration strategist. I'm super excited to be here. I want to thank you for joining. Um, I launched this call because people were asking, Jai, how do you do all the things you do? Um, and I said, with a lot of grace and also with work-life integration. And so I want to share my experience with you. And that's what this call is about. And it is going to be happening. It is happening every Wednesday at noon Mountain Standard Time. That is 2 p.m. Eastern. For those of us joining from the East Coast, that's 11 a.m. For those of us joining Pacific time. So um, today I'm really excited because I want to talk about, do we have to do it all alone? Um, I don't know if this is like a Black thing. I'm not sure. So, you know, men, you can chime in. I know I see Rodney on here. Um, I'm not sure there's someone else that's on here, but I can't tell who it is. But I also would love to hear from the men if this is a men phenomenon, a male phenomenon, if it's a black phenomenon, if it's a woman phenomenon, where we really struggle to ask for help. So um, that's been a, an issue that I personally have faced in my life is coming to folks and asking for help. And so I kind of want to break that down because as we're thinking about how to integrate work in life, one of the things that is imperative to that space is the ability to ask for help or ask for um, assistance, support, um, just those that are in your family, in your immediate circle, in your friend group, in your peer group, in your work group, to kind of get on board at times with various things that you may need. Um, and what should happen in an ideal setting is that it shouldn't be all give and it shouldn't be all take, right? That there should be like a, a give and take relationship inside of your network, whether that's, you know, your home, your family, or if that is your broader, you know, network um, in your business or your career field or whatever the case might be. But um, asking for help is, um, is tough, right? And then what happens when we do? So I kind of just want to want to acknowledge like early on in my life and as this progressed for me, uh, I started to do this, like, I can take on everything. I can take on everything. If you threw it at me and I said yes, which is a whole nother issue that we will address at one point in time. But if I took it on and I said yes, I was going to try and accomplish that. Um, and oftentimes to my own detriment. And you ever heard that uh, there's a phrase that's like, you can see the, the oh, shoot, what is that phrase? Like, you can see the the rock on somebody else, but you got a chip on your own shoulder. Are you trying to check? check the chip on someone else's shoulder, but you got a boulder on yours, something like that. So when this first became really evident for me that oftentimes we struggle to ask for help is when I saw someone else struggling to ask for help. So I am curious if it's a man thing, um, but also what I will acknowledge is the person who I saw in this space was a man. So I was in an organization called Shop Talk Live. Um, if you're in Denver, then that name may resonate with you. Um, so I was in Shop Talk Live, and the leader of Shop Talk Live at this time, um, a man named uh, Quincy, he was, uh, he would constantly be 
putting out tasks and then taking them back, putting out tasks and taking them back. He said, hey, I need to do that. I need, you know, I need help with this. But as soon as he said, I need help, you know what, I'll just go ahead and do it. And so he had a whole team behind him and we were all just kind of sitting there like twirling our thumbs. And so what, what, what started to get frustrating was at some point we were all watching him run around like a chicken with his head cut off. And we were like, bruh, like, are you gonna let us jump in? You going to tap out? You going to let us, you know, help you out with anything? And it was really difficult for him to allow for others to help. So in the end, he ended up feeling overwhelmed, stressed out. Um, he struggled a lot with um, the execution of everything because he was practically the only person executing. Uh, he struggled with making decisions, like there were a lot of struggles that were happening. And as I was observing his behavior, I felt like, I didn't even feel like, I started telling someone else about his behavior, like, girl, let me tell you what he's doing. And they were just giving me the look, like, so no part of you recognizes that that's what you do? And I was like, oh my goodness, like, I do do that. I put out stuff that I say I need help with, and then I take it back. So why do we take things back? Why do we struggle to ask for help? Why do we not enlist the services of others? Um, why do we not allow people to serve in their gifts or serve in places that um, maybe that they are better in than us? And more importantly, how does that play a role in doing things that you can do, but maybe you're not, you shouldn't do or you're not called to do? So. Um, I want to first talk about the space of like what happens inside of our ego when we have to reach out and ask for help. And, uh, and I saw some of that turn of events happening when I was in the military, you know, the military, uh, they begin to change their logo to army of one. And what was interesting in that space was there was an idea that you had to do it all yourself, not an army of one of all of us together, like we're all unified, but it's an army of one. I have to perform, I have to execute, I have to do this myself. And also um, with that hustle mentality is like, I have to do this. There's also this space of, you know, inside of our music, inside of our lyrics, we hear a space where we're like, you know, I got, I got myself out of the gutter. I did this by myself. Nobody helped me out, right? And I wonder like psychologically what all of those different types of messaging messages are doing to us that we feel like if we ask for help, it's a weakness instead of even seeing it as a strength or instead of seeing it as a benefit or understanding that large movements, large visions, large goals are not accomplished inside of one person, right? Even if, even if that person is the brainchild or the catalyst of something that the end all be all execution of it, it has to flow out. Um, and it has to be done with more than one person. And so somewhere in here, we really struggle with how to get out there and ask for help. I know I did. And so one was be, be like how I got over that hump um, is the space of someone calling me out on it. So like I said, I was calling someone else out on it. And then someone called me out on it. And I had to be honest with myself that I was doing that, that I was not allowing for others to help me, that I was not allowing for, um, that, that at times I wasn't even asking for help, or if I did ask for help, that I would be so particular about how I wanted something done, or I really struggled with perfectionism to the point that I would take the task back so that I could do it my way. Um, I want to acknowledge, like, I'm a repeat offender, and I'm still seeking help for this <laughs> now to this day. But I've empowered others around me and in my network to call me out on it as soon as they see it. Like, that's one of the first things that I tell new people who are coming in and close to my network. When you catch me doing this, slap my hand, because it is a habit that has um, taken hold that really does take a lot of time to undo all the things that happen mentally when you want something done your way, only your way, when you think you're the only person who can get it done when you are struggling to ask for help because you're not certain how it's going to be perceived by others and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that happens in that space that we have to acknowledge. Um, so there's the one is the asking for the help, right? And then there's the space and what happens when we ask for help and how we get over some of those traumas. Um, 
feel free to use the chat if you've ever asked anyone for help and they said they were going to help, but then they didn't come through. I have often asked myself, how much damage has been done? Again, psychologically, like all of these things are mindsets and mental spaces that we have to get through. But what kind of trauma and damage is done when I reach out and I ask you for help? So I've had, there's a place in my ego that I've had to, to quash down and say, I need help and I'm going to reach out and ask. And then I do reach out and ask. And not only do I ask, but you agree to help. And then you don't show up and you don't help. Um, what happens to that broken trust? What happens to us inside when we feel like we've been vulnerable and then we're met with that disappointment? I know that for me, um, that has been a terrible place because when I was called out about not asking for help, I began to get intentional about asking for help. And I would say, yes, I need help with my children. Um, as a mom, that's sometimes hard to admit or acknowledge that you need help with your children, right? Like, I need help with my home. Um, I need help with my business. I remember when I got into this space, I certainly wasn't a business coach at all. Um, I was actually a person when I got into the Black Business Initiative, I was a person who had been a serial entrepreneur. I saw a documentary. I saw a gap and a need for um, information to come out to Black businesses, and I decided to try to fill that gap. When I first started the Black Business Initiative, I had actually enlisted um, folks that were experts in their field. So I had, attorney, I had an attorney, I had an accountant, I had someone in marketing, and they all came and taught the classes. And I just opened up and facilitated the classes and welcomed everybody to come on into the Black Business Initiative. Over time, because of what I was creating, it forced me to learn a new skill like business coaching because that's what people were expecting, right? But what happens when you have an organization that is known for helping businesses and then you have to raise your hand and say, actually, I need help with my business um, because I was pushed into this space or I, well, I created this space for myself. I let me, let me own that. I created this space for myself in an area that I wasn't originally an expert in. And so, you know, when I started to reach out and ask people for help, and I was met with a lot of enthusiasm around, yes, I can help you, but then in action, in execution, uh, those things didn't happen. It really damaged um, internally, it damaged a lot of relationships. And then also, for myself, I, it, it began to break my trust in me being able to ask anyone, like not just a person. I started to struggle to ask anyone for help. And I still kept getting met with that same resistance. I still kept getting met with the same person telling me, look at what you're doing. You're not asking for help. And I'm like, I am asking for help. And people say they can help and they don't help. And so I want to acknowledge that space if anyone has ever um, experienced that because it's painful to have to overcome ego and still be met with disappointment. But it's important to still continue to reach out. And what that did was that caused me to start qualifying my network better. And it also started, um, caused me to um, really have to uh, vet who I was asking to make sure that the type of person that I was asking was similar in nature to me, that if they said they were gonna do something, they were gonna do something. Yeah, Danielle said that, that that's happened as well. Yeah, I, and it's tough, right? It's like, it's, I just, I personally think that that is one of the toughest things is when you've had to become vulnerable in a space and you're still met with disappointment. And sometimes it can seem like a little thing, but oftentimes it's not. And so I have, I have experience after experience that starts to add up. And so when you're experiencing like traumas like that, especially sometimes when they can feel like these small traumas, Sometimes they can be big. Like I had people who told me they were going to be here for an event. They didn't show up for an event. I need to make sure that my brand is intact. So now I'm running around and there are pieces of my brand that fall through the cracks um, because there were gaps that were left and holes that I asked to be filled and they weren't filled. And my brand, of course, is something that's important to me. But you can find those spaces in all over the place. On a more personal level, you know, I had a conversation um, 
with my two little ones with their father about co-parenting. So we had a whole, we had like a long extensive conversation about the type of help that I needed with the kids. He's their father. What can he contribute? How does he want to show up? What did he need for me? Like, you know, whole conversation about how we co-parent. And this man didn't follow through on none of the things that he said he was going to do, right? And so then I end up finding myself parenting alone, um, even though their father is around. And so like you find these spaces where someone has made a commitment to you or made a promise to you and they failed on their end and it causes gaps on your end. And in particular, if you've ever been vulnerable in that space, it, it can be a struggle to work on how you come back to the table and trust or even how you open up to the next person and allow them to trust. So I, you know, one of the things that I learned to do, again, was to qualify my network a little bit better. So I started looking at how people were showing up in their lives and determining if that was someone that I wanted to have in my life. Because sometimes you can see things, and I don't profess that you can see everything on social media or anything, but in the various spaces of where you are, whether you're at work, whether you're in business and you see how they show up in community, whether you see how they're showing up online, whether you've had some interaction with them, or maybe you see how they're interacting with someone else, you can begin to see how a person shows up in space. Uh, without making all the assumptions, you can begin to make an educated guess or determination about if that person is valuable inside of your network. And sometimes it's just not now. Like there are times that I've met people saw them where they were at that time, didn't necessarily see them as being a value add to my network. I didn't see how I could be a value add to their network. So we didn't make a connection. And then later on, as, as uh, you know, you continue to see them in spaces and places, there may be something at, at another point that clicks. So these determinations don't have to be forever and for always. They don't have to be, um, these, these types of determinations don't have to be, uh, you know, permanent determinations, right? But it helps you begin to think about how you're seeing your network by who are you putting yourself around and who do you think that you should be, that you should be around, right? How can I benefit you and how can you benefit me? And so thinking about those networks reciprocally in a reciprocal fashion, because that's how we get to a space where we don't have to do it alone. Because at the end of the day, what I, what I, my experience says, y'all catch me on that one. My experience says that we oftentimes try to go at reaching big goals alone, but we do not have to do it alone. We should not do it alone. And how do we shield ourselves from some of those hurts and disappointments while still opening ourselves up to trusting and being trusted so that we can be someone that someone can call on and we know that in our network we can call on someone. Um, there was a gentleman here and um, then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about if you decide to my assignment for you, um, but I'll end with this story. So there was a gentleman that was here um, recently in my space. And he knows a ton of people, like a lot of people. And a lot of people actually know him. And um, what I learned recently, because he was, this only came about because he was throwing my name out there, like how he knew me. I know Jice, I know Jice, I know Jice. I don't know why people do that. Um, but I know Jice, I know Jice, I know Jice. So people, people started coming up to me to give me their experience on this person. And I wanted to share that feedback with him because I think sometimes it's important to be aware as to how you're showing up in space. And so what I told him was, I said, actually, what's happening is, is that a lot of people know you, but they know of your reputation, that you don't follow through on what you say you're going to do, that you start a lot of things, you don't complete them, that you have, you know, these big ideas and you talk about them in the present tense, like you're doing them, but you're not actually doing them, you know, and so you've damaged a lot of your relationships. When you're asking yourself the question about, do I have to do it alone? A lot of that comes back to how you're showing up and who's in your circle. All of this comes back to who is in your circle, who is in your space, right? And not only if, if you feel like they're not the best people to be around after doing some evaluation, after thinking about who's in your space, you've got to ask yourself if you're a good person to be around. If you're reliable, if you follow through on your word, if someone knows that they can toss a task to you and that it's actually going to get completed, right? So I had that conversation. It was a really tough conversation to have, but it was important because with this feedback, right, without feedback, how do you make those changes? Or without self-assessment, self how do you make changes? 
And so I explained to him part of why he was struggling to ever reach any of his goals is because he thinks he has a network and his network or the people that know him do not see him in the same light that he believes that he's being seen. So, um, so this leads me to talking about what your assignment is, which is to think about your network. Think about your network. I don't want to just throw out that like the five closest people to you, but hopefully you've heard that that saying, right? The five people that you spend the most time with are indicative of where it is that you're going um, or, or where your current circumstances that have placed you. But I want you to think past those five. Like think about the top five family members that you are um, – that you maybe involve yourself with. Is that how you want to show up in your family? Are they indicative of how you want to show up in your family? Think about that in your business or in your career. Think about that in your peer group, because sometimes those places cross and sometimes they don't. Think about that maybe if you have like a faith home or a church space. Think about that in your political circle. You can think about that in any circle that you're in. You can think about that as a cumulative circle, but start to go through and qualify your network because you want to ask yourself, are the people that are in my network people that I know that I can count on? That's part one, part A. Part B is to ask yourself, are you someone that people can count on? And if you are someone that people can count on, how do you qualify that? Do you know that people call you and ask you for quality tasks? When I mean a quality task, it isn't like, hey, can you come help me move, right? Because like, that's grunt work. I mean, I've helped people move. It doesn't, it's that, that doesn't mean anything if that's what they're asking you for. But really, like, begin to ask yourself, are people calling on me for things of quality? When someone calls and asks me a question or asks me for a favor or asks me to complete a task, is this a task and a quality that is in my skill set, that is in alignment with what I do, is in alignment with who I want to be known as, is in alignment with um, the space that I want to show up in? Because if not, they may not know you in that space, right? So th that will help to start determining like how you begin to make internal changes for yourself is indicative of how people are viewing you and how people are seeing you. And you can make some of those determinations by what they're calling you for. So those are your two sides. One is who you're around and two is how are you showing up? So I would take some time to journal or work through that over the, the course of the next week as you begin to think about your network and how you're showing up in your network because as we continue to dig into a variety of aspects of high performance and, um, and what it looks like in work-life integration, that's a, an important role is who you're able to call on when you need to get something done, right? And who's able to call on you? And are those calls quality calls? Are you able to differentiate? Like I can tell you now, there's no one that's calling me to ask me to move today. A couple years ago, maybe. Today, no one is going to call me and say, hey, I need help moving because they don't see me in that light. They don't see that as something that is of value to me. They don't wanna waste my time in that way. They don't wanna use up their social capital for something like that with me. So how are you showing up? And are the people that are asking you things of quality so that they know that when, when it's time to come to you, that these are the types of requests that need to come to you. So. That's what I have for you today, but I want to open it up for some Q&A. Are there any questions or comments or thoughts about what we talked about? Hey, Joyce. Yes. Awesome segment today. And just to chime in a little bit on what you were saying about, you know, one thing I've always learned is, you know, your teamwork makes your dream work. But, you know, we talk about asking, asking for help. You know, sometimes it could be a insecurity problem you know with not an insecurity problem but just some things that may have happened to you in your past you know individuals that have let you down before and then also you know that you you know it's, it is hard to ask for help i, I know in, in my situation with my organization and my business it's sometimes hard to ask for help because people are just have been proving themselves to be undependable and if they do show up they don't show up with the type of quality that you think that they had or they have shown before so it's somewhat of a disappointment or a letdown. So it's okay. It's okay to, um, 
not feel some kind of way because you demand certain things. You have a bar that you have, you know, set, you know, standards to, and that's what you expect out of people. And, but, but it also goes back to, like you said, or make sure that you're giving out what you're asking to come in. Make sure you give that 110 to other individuals as you ask them to come and bring 110 to give to you. Um, so that, that, that asking for help thing, you know, can go a, a lot of different ways. You know, my encouragement to people is just always know who you're dealing with, you know, what their characteristics is, you know, about their character. You know, yeah. when they come, when they show up, will they show up and, and deliver as you, as they know, as you know, they can deliver and they have delivered in the past. Don't come and give me 50% of something just because we cool. You give me the same energy, the same 100%, you know, as you would give the next individual, you know? Yeah, so I, I, and I, 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 love, I agree with that. Ahead, no, no, I, I agree with, I agree with what you're saying. Here's my challenge to you when you're finding those folks in your network, right? Is the process in which you start to clear them out of your network. Like that's really important um, because it's not that you love people less. And I think sometimes that that comes off um, you know, we want to maintain, especially if they're long-term relationships or friends or the homies, you know, we want to maintain those relationships. However, what you really got to recognize in that space is that as you want to elevate, like you're not going to elevate above, far above where your network currently is. So if right. those people are still around you, then you have to start distancing yourself from them. You have to stop asking them for things, right? And then you have to be able to have those tough conversations to explain why that is. Like, hey, actually, I've asked you for things in the past. You haven't been dependable. I don't love you any less. But then you can start to compartmentalize where people go inside of your space, right? So if they're continuously around your organization, what you're doing is you're lowering the quality of your organization. You're lowering the output of your organization because the folks that are around your organization are not the quality that you need or want. And what I've learned is that you can't get the right people in because you haven't cleared the wrong people out. It's like you have to make room and make space for what you want to come in. And you can't do that as long as what you don't want, you're still trying to hold on to because you want to stay safe, you want to maintain relationship, you don't want to hurt someone. You're just, you know, you maybe you don't know how to have that conversation. Start putting them in a space that makes more sense. I still have a ton of people that I know that I that I see around and things like that. Like when I go to the cupping party this Saturday, that's going to be a whole nother thing. Right now, I'm shaking my ass at the club. Like, that's a whole nother group of folks, right? Then who is, who I'm expecting to show up inside of the business and inside the organization in a way, who I'm expecting to show up as my tribe around my children, who I'm expecting to show up in my tribe around my faith and my spirituality. Like, those are not all the same people. And so those people sound like they don't work for you in that, in that space. And you maintain their relationship in a different space. You have to migrate them out in order for you to migrate the right type of people that you need to come in. You know, Jason, if I was to take one thing away from this 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 uh, conversation, this call today, I would probably say inspect your expectations. Mm -hmm. I appreciate okay. that. Of course. Awesome. Anyone else have a comment or a question? So just for a couple of you that are joining, um, we are talking about um, how to ask for help and also how to be a person that is worthy of being asked for help. So really around qualifying your network and also thinking about yourself showing up in that space. Any other questions, any comments? Y'all are an easy bunch. Okay, no worries. So um, next week, we will be here same time, noon, Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific um, with another topic. And of course, bring your questions, bring your own insight to the table. That's always wildly helpful. I'm so excited to be able to share my insight with you. Um, and I just want to remind you of your homework because I hope that you don't just take these calls, but that you actually do something that helps you implement them. So the homework for this uh, for this call today 
um, I will answer the question about the replay in just a second. But my hope for these calls today is that you actually um, take what we've learned or what, what my experiences are that I'm sharing and anything that you've learned and, and gleaned from this space and apply it. So um, what, I, you know, what I said was that you need to go and spend time thinking about your network and qualifying your network. Begin to think about people that maybe are not reliable, not dependable. Also begin thinking about people that you might want to add into your network that maybe aren't presently there. And so you can begin to think about how to develop your network. It is perfectly fine, and I'll add this in here. I didn't add this the first time, but it is really perfectly fine to um, – be intentional about how you cultivate and groom a network. You can see someone and think that person looks really awesome from the, from the outside. I'd love to have them as a part of my network and be intentional about building a relationship with them, right? Even when you don't have something that you necessarily want from them or that you think that you can offer, you can work on building relationships with people that you find that you believe would add value to your network one way or another. And there are a lot of ways that we can do that. I mean, that you can do that. Um, I will add that to my notes to talk more about how you build relationships, but be thinking about who's currently in your network. And then on the other side, really spend some time assessing, like take a self-assessment of for yourself. Be honest, because sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to acknowledge like, oh, damn, I'm not as reliable as I thought I was, or I don't actually show up the way I want to. You know, sometimes you see on like social media, they make these like jokes. Like, yeah, I told you I was going to come out, but I'm really about to just stay in my bed, right? Like, think about the mentality of that person um, and what that means for them to tell someone that, yes, I'm going to go out and hang out with you tonight, but really what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stay in this bed, right? So, like, they are qualifying themselves as not a good network to be around because they don't follow through and they don't have integrity on in what they say they're going to do. If you don't want to go out, just say, I don't want to go out, right? So, um, but that, that's been kind of this, like, you know, it, it's like making a joke of being the type of person who doesn't honor your word. So ask yourself, like, am I the type of person that honors my word? Am I the type of person that shows up? Am I present for people that are in my network? And therefore, my, the people in my network know that I can be relied on and depended on. So begin to do that self-assessment for yourself. And if you're not, just make the changes. If you found that over time, you may have damaged your own network or your own name, make the changes. Make the changes and start showing up differently. It's never too late to make an adjustment and a change to yourself. So hopefully you find that helpful. Um, thank you all for joining our call. This is the High Performance at High Noon call with your girl, Jice Johnson, and um, replay. So I will have replays available. This is my second call. Um, I'm not 100% sure just yet where those replays are going to be, but the call is recorded and it is downloaded to my local computer. And I am working with my tech person to figure out where it's going to be the best place, space to put those. Um, it may be on YouTube, but I will have an answer. I'm going to make a commitment to have an answer by next week on Wednesday as to where you can catch the replays. Is that fair? Hopefully that's fair. Perfect. All right, y'all, I'm going to release you back for your afternoon. Thank you for joining me for this midweek call, and I will see you next week on Wednesday at noon. Thank you. Have a great week. You too.